Welcome to the Every Voice Now podcast, where we bring voices of color into the spotlight. In every episode, you'll hear stories of our authors of color, how God led them to write their books, and the challenges they had to overcome along the way. Hi, everyone. It's Helen Lee here, one of the producers of the Every Voice Now podcast. And I'm so excited to introduce today's guest, Sabrina Chan, who, along with Linson Daniel, E. David de Leon, and La Tao, co authored the IVP book, Learning Our Names Asian American Christians on Identity, Relationships, and Vocation. Sabrina is the National Director of Asian American Ministries for InterVarsity Christian Fellowship USA. She's also an ordained minister and earned a master's degree in theology from Fuller Theological Seminary. In this episode, you will hear some references to another IVP book that was previously featured on the podcast, Following Jesus Without Dishonoring Your Parent. So you could say that Learning Our Names is a descendant of that book, which had such an impact on many, many people, myself included. So I encourage you to go and listen to that episode with Jeanette Yep and Greg Howe if you haven't had a chance to already. But now I invite you to sit back and enjoy and learn from this conversation with Sabrina Chan. I'm excited to welcome Sabrina Chan to the Every Voice Now podcast today. Thanks for joining us, Sabrina. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Well, as you know, we love to talk about people's stories, especially their ethnic identity journey stories, as well as their publishing journey stories here on the podcast. So let's start with the ethnic identity journey and would love to have you just share about your ethnic background and identify some key markers in that journey for you over the years, if you don't mind. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I'm, you know, I sometimes describe myself as Chinese American, sometimes Cantonese American, or you can just say my parents' roots are from Hong Kong and Guangdong. It's, you know, complicated politically with China. But I think maybe a key, some key things, one of them I wrote about in our book, in my chapter on race, a key thing was feeling very excluded growing up. Mm. I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, which at the time didn't have a very high Asian American population, still, yeah. still isn't huge, but grew up going to, in my earliest years, going to an all-white church and a mostly white private Christian school, mm. I think I, you know, my parents were doing the best they could. Yeah. Right? And I think now I can look back and see that for sure. And they were really choosing faith, mm. I think, in some ways over mm. culture in that space. But, you know, just really, I think there were bullying incidents and yeah. just othering that, you know, I, I read about in the chapter. I think that's really marked that really framed a lot of my growing up, just feeling othered. So I went into college very, I had a lot of internalized racism. I didn't mm. join any Asian student organizations. Yeah. And I think there was a sense of, why would I join that? Then people will really know that mm. I'm Asian, right? Mm. And it'll be mm-hmm. different. Mm-hmm. And in InterVarsity, I got involved in InterVarsity. Actually, I walked away from the faith for a while and came back mm. to faith in college. And it was actually really there that I started to engage faith and culture and mm. race and identity and Paul Tokadaga, who was the Asian American Ministries Director at the time, came to speak at our one of our conferences, and he wanted to gather the Asian American students. There were only like four or five of us. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And as he tells the story, I was like, why would we want <laughs> to gather? Like, what? what? Again, I think that feeling of like, oh, we're going to be seen as different, and mm-hmm. I don't want to be seen as different. And as he tells it, as a dutiful Asian, I still came um, <laughs> to the gathering. <laughs> I remember meeting Paul and, you know, that kind of stuff. but. The earlier book, Following Jesus Without Dishonoring Your Parents, was mm-hmm. a really key point for me, mm. recognizing that, oh, it's not just my family that is like this. Or like I could recognize, I could see some of myself in some of those stories, see some yeah. of my family in those stories, see, you know, Paul writing about not feeling like he measured up or mm-hmm. feeling othered. And I was like, oh, it's not just me. That was really big. Mm. And then, Getting to go on a, a summer missions program with some other Asian American students from other parts of the country was was really key. But and then after college, delving into Asian American history, yeah. um, reading on my own. You know, I never had any of that. I never under, mm-hmm. never learned any of it. So starting to read and understand about more about Japanese American mm-hmm. incarceration and mm-hmm. uh, Chinese exclusion and just different things, the things I had access to at the time, that was significant. 
I loved hearing all that family history. And I remember reading in your book about some of these kind of childhood moments that are challenging to go back and remember. But I'm wondering if you don't mind retelling a, one of the or two of those moments that kind of stick in your head as being very foundational for you for those early years, for those childhood years of mm-hmm. uh, of producing for you kind of a sense of that marginalization, that othering that you wrote about. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. My first memory of school is being in the cafeteria. I think we were in there to rehearse for something, like there was a stage. Mm -hmm. And one of my friends or friends at the time looked over at me and then did that chant. You know that, I'm sure you know it, Chinese, Japanese, dirty knees, like that, the whole thing. And I I just felt the shame rising up. I couldn't have articulated what was happening necessarily. Nobody told him what he did was wrong. I just felt I did something wrong. I don't know what's happening. What does this have to do with anything, you know? Mm. So the fact that he was supposed to be my friend and was saying that, it it just it was really powerful. It was a really powerful negative, obviously Mm -hmm. negative experience. And I think that feeling of shame you know, I think it was, it was really actually powerful to write about it in Mm. the chapter because I realized, I think, and you know, working in therapy or in different conversations and in prayer, like there's a way that I think the rest of my growing up, I was trying to just avoid that feeling. Mm. Like I never want to feel that again. So whatever I can do to avoid that feeling. So, you know, that trying not to make mistakes Mm. in front of the class, right. Or Mm -hmm. trying to fit in or trying to do whatever, Susie, Bob, or whoever, you know, wants me to do when we're playing, Mm -hmm. you know, like playing pretend, I'll do whatever role Mm -hmm. they want me to pretend because I just want to be included. I don't want to feel excluded. Like we literally played this game, Rainbow Bright was some cartoon back then. And literally I was always the little tiny sprite that was like the sidekick. And like, so I, you know, those campaigns about not your Asian sidekick, I was like, yes. I was always the sprite, the one that Mm. didn't have a name. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, that's all I had to play, you know, or whatever. But yeah, I think trying to avoid that feeling really dictated a lot of Mm. my, a lot of the way I interacted with the world. And I don't think that's uncommon. The push to assimilate the ways that racialization affects Asian Americans to say, like, we'll conditionally include you Mm -hmm. if you play by the rules, keep your yeah. head down, contribute, don't make too much noise, yeah. you know, like it's really pervasive. It's really mm-hmm. strong. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, so yeah, I, I, you know, I write about that in the chapter. Like, I feel like we're trying to avoid that perpetual foreigner and the model minority <laughs> offers a potential <laughs> escape. Right. But it's a trap, right? right? It's a total trap. Right. Right. And yeah. And I think that's why some of the reading Following Jesus Without Dishonoring Your Parents for me was really powerful because it it allowed me to hear from others who had experienced some of the same things mm-hmm. and not sort of write it off. Well, oh, that's just me. Or maybe that's only my thought. And I actually think that's a pretty key thing. And as we've worked in AAM, offering spaces for Asian Americans of many different backgrounds and cultures to talk together, because it's actually as we talk about it together that it yeah. becomes more solid for us because we're so used to pushing it down. We're so used to saying like, oh, well, maybe it's just me. But then as you voice it to someone else and they're like, oh yeah, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. Then it's almost like, oh, okay, we have that affirmation, that communal sense of like, yeah, that it's not just me. Some of that is the racism that, that makes us think, oh, it might just be me. But there's power when we're more together and being able to talk about it that we can actually figure out what's going on. So that's good. Thank you for sharing your story, both in the book and also just right now, because I think it just helps, to, again, to voice these stories and name them and acknowledge that these kinds of pain points exist for you and more broadly for Asian American Christians. And I am yeah. I would love to hear you articulate. So you have that story on one hand and you have the fact that you are now the national director of Asian American Ministries at University Christian Fellowship. And I'd love to hear, I'm asking these like, big questions, but would love to hear a little bit about how you would summarize how you got from point A to point B in terms of your own recovery from that Mm. moment of shame, which was so foundational for you, it sounds like, and had an impact on you, a deep impact. So tell us a little bit about the work you had to do to get 
from that mm-hmm. point of being like, I do not want to have anything to do with mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. cultural heritage I've been given to mm-hmm. being and now at a level of national leadership representing mm-hmm. Asian American ministries. Yeah. So different spaces of prayer ministry mm-hmm. or, you know, therapy. You know, I got to participate in a, a group that was working on racial trauma mm-hmm. and really bringing a memory and writing a memory. Actually, that was the memory I wrote about for that mm-hmm. group to sort of to look at it more, to see like, where is mm-hmm. Jesus in this? You know, where would Jesus yeah. have been? And in those processes, really feeling like, oh, Jesus is, was with me. Because, you know, a big part was like, why did nobody tell this kid that that's not okay? Where did the kid learn that phrase? You know, like those things and Jesus being with me in that and saying like, that's not okay. And I'm going to hold you. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. Those were significant places. I would say just what I was referring to earlier, spaces to really engage with others and feel not alone and Mm -hmm. recognize like, oh, this is a bigger thing. This is something that other people experience. This is something that the system of race in America, Mm -hmm. right, has set up, right? That there's a lot more pieces to it. And I'll say, you know, it happened over time, right? It wasn't like all one thing. And it continues, right? It continues in journey. But I do feel like that's the space thing. As Asian American Ministries Director, as someone who's just been in various churches and different spaces, I I do feel like having those places, you know, as part of a multi-ethnic church in in the Bay Area that has a had Asian Americans as a part of the church. And what I loved was at one point, the church made space for each community, every community mm. to gather and just talk about like, what's it like to be mm. whatever the identity was in our church? And what are the things that you feel like you're learning about as you grow in faith and in your culture? So there's like lots of different groups met. But I think Particularly Asian Americans need that space because we mm. just haven't been given it for yeah. so long. And, it, and it's hard to say, oh, we need this space. Yeah. You know, we're going to, you know, because like I was saying, the push to assimilate. Mm-hmm. So that's actually one of my hopes for the book is that for our book is that it creates more opportunities for people to mm. see like, oh, here's a space that we can create in the book, but also mm-hmm. hopefully mm-hmm. folks can gather to discuss it. Like, because there's things we know, like won't connect with everybody and people will be like, oh, I don't really understand that. Like, what do you think? Yeah. You know, I hope it creates space for those kinds of conversations. Yeah, I'm sure it already has. So, yeah. And it's amazing when you look at and you mentioned um, following Jesus without dishonoring your parents. And we had actually had Greg Howe and Jeanette yep, yeah, on the show. I listened to that. That was yeah, really a little, sweet. A little while back to talk about the heritage of that book. And that book has had, I mean, decades, mm-hmm. you know, of ministry still does. Yeah. So it makes me think that similarly, learning our names will have that kind of legacy and that kind mm-hmm. of impact on students and beyond in the church. Yeah, in in so. years to come. So, so yeah, so we're going to def- definitely talk a little bit more about the book for sure. But I would love to hear a little bit about your own maybe aspirations of writing as you look back on your own childhood. Like, do you ever, did sure. you think I'm going to be a writer someday? I'm going to be, I'm going to have my name on the cover of a book. Was this something you ever desired and dreamt about or did it just happen? I don't think I, ha- I did not have that category. Yeah. I think I love to read. Mm. I read all the time, all the time, all the time. I don't think I had the category of being an author. You know, some of it is, we had so few Asian American books. Actually, I didn't have any. There was one that I think sure. a neighbor gave us that was like, I now realize is totally racist. <laughs> it was like one of these like kids tales about why, why you should name your kids short names because there's some kid that falls down a well and it's, is really racist. Oh gosh. Um, like now that I really, you know, now that I think about it. So I didn't have that category, but you know, when I, Later after, and I was an engineer, so I was trained mm-hmm. as an engineer. So I didn't okay. think learning to write papers in seminary was like, oh, wait, how does this work? But when I was first on staff, I remember my first staff team that I was a part of, they thought, we think, think you're going to write a book. Hmm. We think someday you're going to write a book. And I was like, oh, really? That's interesting. So when we were hmm. working on this, I asked a couple of those folks who were on that first staff team, like, hey, you remember you, you said I would write a book. Can you pray for me in this process? Because this is really hard. But yeah, I actually never really, maybe after I came on staff and mm-hmm. started reading more and thinking about it more, but as a kid, no, uh, <laughs> that was just too out there. I love that your colleagues though saw that potential mm, in you, yeah. even though you had that major background of uh, being an engineer that they could see that you also had yeah. gifts yeah, in communicating yeah. with words, which I love. I love hearing like, those kinds of stories. I would love to actually hear a little bit about your staff journey because I don't think we talked about that, your journey to ministry and becoming an yeah, university sure. staff worker. And 
Mm-hmm. How did that go with your family and all those kinds of fun questions? Yes. Yeah, I was an, like I said, I was an engineer, electrical and computer. And junior, senior year of high school, realized, I mean, college, sorry, realized, oh, I'm, I really love ministry. Like I love talking with people about faith and mm. culture and what does it mean to follow Jesus, all these different things. I still liked solving problems as an engineer, but I, I also wasn't like, and it was hard work, but mm-hmm. the people is what I was really gravitating towards. So started learning more about what it might mean to join InterVarsity staff, talked to my parents about it. My dad wrote me a four page letter Oh wow! that came in the mail. Yes. Know? I think we had email, but he didn't, it was printed. And my parents were opposed, partly for secure. I think they wanted to make sure that I could establish myself and yeah. provide for myself, right? InterVarsity staff raised support. I think that's yeah. not an easy thing. I also think they had some helpful thoughts. My father actually was in ministry or he was bivocational okay. um, for a long time and wanted to do full-time ministry, I think at one point, but also had seen a lot of people do full-time ministry and leave. Mm. And so I think he felt like if you do some years as an engineer, you won't wonder later what would it have been like if I had gone the engineering route? He's like, mm-hmm. then you'll know. And so you won't have to wonder. So, I mean, it was mixed. It was a really hard few years, those years that I was working as an engineer, because mm-hmm. I so wanted to be on staff. Mm-hmm. So many of my friends had joined in varsity staff. And oh, I felt wow. really, I felt left behind. Oh. You know, like, <laughs> what did I do wrong? Well, God, why mm-hmm. can't I do that that I really want to do? And mm-hmm. so it was really painful. But looking back, I totally see the wisdom in it. Mm-hmm. and. You know, and I've been on staff for 20 oh my something, gosh. 21, Has it been that long? something like that. It's been wow. a long time. <laughs> and there are parts where my dad was right, right? Mm. Like there are times when I've been like, I know it got hard and I would have wondered what would it have been like. So maybe yeah. for my journey, that was what was needed. Yeah. So I volunteered in those years that I was mm-hmm. working as an engineer. Mm-hmm. And so then when it came time to consider staff, really the hardest thing was moving because they invited mm. me to move to Austin to staff a large Asian American fellowship there. And and that was challenging. Just, you know, life after college is hard and transition. And then I was like, oh, but I just built my life here in Houston. (laughs) But but yeah, that's some of it. Mm. Yeah. Later on through my church, I got ordained, which at that point was a significant, I think, vocational piece. Because by then it was like, to me, as I, as we discussed ordination with my pastor, he was like, I see these gifts. The Mm -hmm. church wants to affirm them, da, da, da. I was like, well, what does ordination mean for me? And as I prayed about it, I felt like, oh, I think God's inviting me to commit to ministry as a vocation for life, as mm. far as I can see, right? Not to say that God can't change that later, sure. but it felt sure. like that's the next invitation. Because when I when I said yes to staff, it was like a five-year. Mm-hmm. It was like, I don't know. And by that, then I was like eight, nine years in. And I was like, oh, I think... <laughs> so that's what ordination meant for me. And it's been an adventure. Like mm. ministry in general has been... Yeah. Has been a good adventure. Before we get back to our conversation, I want to let you know about a book from Nijay Gupta called Tell Her Story, How Women Led, Taught, and Ministered in the Early Church. For centuries, discussions of early Christianity have focused on male leaders in the church, but there's ample evidence right there in the New Testament that women were actively involved in ministry at the frontier of the gospel mission and as respected leaders. In this book, Nijay Gupta calls us to bring these women out of the shadows by shining light on their many inspiring contributions to the planting, growth, and health of the first Christian churches. You'll discover the major roles of women such as Phoebe, Priscilla, Junia, and Nympha. So stay tuned until the end of the episode to learn how you can get a fabulous deal on Tell Her Story. You're listening to the Every Voice Now podcast, and I'm Helen Lee talking today with Sabrina Chan, who, along with Linson Daniel, E. David de Leon, and Latau, co-authored Learning Our Names. Sabrina, could you tell me a little bit more about the genesis of this book and how the four of you got together to make this book a reality? Well, I took this role about five years ago. Mm-hmm. And one of the first things I was thinking about, I can't remember if I wrote about it in my application. I don't think I wrote about it in my application. But as I, mm. as I was like doing that first bit of like, let me just talk to staff and learn about what's been happening and what, you know, continuing to happen. One of the things I had in my head was, I think it's time to write another book. Mm. You know, because it had been 20 some years since following Jesus without designing your parents. I loved that 
Nikki and Tracy and the team had done more than serving mm-hmm. tea, but even that had been a bit of time. Yeah. And I, especially because we had been working so hard, previous directors and the community had been working so hard on growing our ministry amongst Filipino, Southeast mm-hmm. Asian, South Asian students. It felt like, oh, that I would love for us to include those voices. Mm-hmm. And also, you know, things change in yeah. the nature of race does change and culture. So I, I did talk to Al. He was a friend and we had been in the Daniel Project together. Mm-hmm. And I was like, hey, Al, you know, like, I was thinking about this. I was wondering, actually, if there was space at the time for, like, should we do a South Asian book? Should we mm. do a Southeast Asian book? You know, more specific, like, should we do that? Or should we try and do a coalition book at this point or whatever? Mm-hmm. And as we talked about it, he was like, well, I think since it's been a while, I think it'd probably be better to do a coalition book and then see after that, like mm-hmm. see how things progress. Let's make yeah. space for more voices. And so that was fun. It, and it was fun to talk to others about like, do you think it's time? Do you think mm. it's time? And then, and then figure out like, okay, so who, who is writing yeah. in these communities? And like, you know, it didn't have to be formal, but like, mm-hmm. what are some of these spaces? And so, you know, I knew Linson from when he was a student, actually, back oh, at, at wow. UT. Okay. He was also an engineer. And so, you know, like <laughs> that kind of thing. And so I was like, oh, I know Linson blogs and had met David in California. And like, and so just as I started thinking about like, and praying about like, who would be people mm. to invite and talk to Al, right? I was like, hey, mm-hmm. Al, who would be good? And actually, Al had to convince me that I should be on the team. Oh, my He's goodness. Like, it would make sense, Rita, <laughs> as the director of Asian American Ministries. I was like, yeah, but are you sure? Like, I think I needed that permission to sort of say, mm. I was like, because secretly I was like, oh, I've kind of always wanted to maybe write something, but I don't know. Like, you know, since, since that staff friends had said something, he's like, no, I think that'd be good. And I was like, mm. okay. So interesting. Lot, you know, so interesting that we have to have well. that permission. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know Law as well, but others knew her and were like, we know she's blogging and she's mm. like really thoughtful. And mm. I have to say, La was like, always kept us, she was the best at deadlines. Mm. And I think, I mean, we all have our different styles. Yeah. I envy La's style the most because she says <laughs> so much in like, like in a compact but conversational and understandable way. Anyway, so <laughs> that was kind of the process of pulling together folks and, and thinking about like, what things do we want to address? What's changed in the last 20 mm. years? What are the things that we see? And we got together with Kathy Kong. Kathy also lives in Chicago and we were going to yeah. gather in Chicago and Greg yeah. Howe hosted us at his house. And she just said, you know, I think we should start, y'all should start just, she was kind of my consultant for like, Mm -hmm. hey, how does a book proposal work? (laughs) What happens? Not that we couldn't get that information from Al too, but you know, Mm -hmm. it's nice to have a, someone else helping. And she was like, oh, I think y'all should start just by sharing your stories, your Mm -hmm. leadership stories, and let's see what's common in them. Mm -hmm. And then let's see what we want to write about. And yeah, that's kind of the, and then we got a lot of input. So Mm -hmm. partway through the writing process, we were like, some of us had, it's been a while since we have worked directly with students day to day. This was like, oh, we need to get some help mm. on this. And so consulted a, a group of, I think it was seven or eight folks, had them read early on. Nice. Staff from a lot of different backgrounds to say like, hey, is this helpful? What's helpful? Mm. What's not helpful? What's missing? They were great. Yeah. Super helpful. How often did you gather in person? Yeah. Yeah. So I was trying really hard not to overtax people. Like in retrospect, I actually wish we had gathered more. Mm. And I told the team that later. I was like, I was trying not to, I already Mm. felt bad, not bad, but I already felt like I was asking a lot and, and I didn't want to add more meetings. But in retrospect, I wish we had, I had done a little bit more, especially on the front end. But Mm. probably the part when we did the most writing and revising of each other's stuff, Mm. we met once a week Mm. and every, for a whole semester. Oh, and wow. every week somebody would have like what they had had sent out what they had worked on and yeah. would offer feedback That's cool. uh, or ideas. So yeah, we met once a week for like a whole semester. Mm-hmm. And then after that it was less often, but yeah, just trying to trying to get our stuff revised and yeah, and everything in the midst of the pandemic, in right? The midst of so the three pandemic. of us yeah. three of us have young kids. And so it was just in the pandemic that mm. was like it was pretty tough. Yeah. Oh my god. There goodness. were parts where I I thought I don't know if I'm going to get I felt particularly I was always the last one. <laughs> um, but also I just was like, oh, this is like going through some health challenges and stuff. I was mm. like, I don't know if, are we going to get this done? I mm. kind of want to give up. But I was like, but there's three other people who've worked really hard on this. I can't give up, yeah. right? We got to get this to print. Like, I don't want, I want this work. It's so, 
I was confident in the other people's writing. <laughs> I wasn't confident in mine, but I was like, we just got to get this out. Like it's, mm. it, their stuff is so good. I don't feel awesome about my stuff, but uh. like, let's make this happen. You know what I mean? So that kept me going. If it had just been by myself, I'm mm. sure I would have given up. So that's where I think the power of community is really, oh, for really sure. valuable, you know? Yeah. Oh, it helps to hear that backstory because sometimes when you look at a book like this where you feel like, okay, like they just divide up the chapters, they each wrote their stuff, and then it was probably like very straightforward. But no, I mean, it sounds like, first of all, you all were really collaborative in the way that you read each other's work and offered input, which is mm-hmm. great. And then, of course, you layer on all those other challenges you just mentioned because I how could I forget the pandemic? But you sometimes forget like who's working on what projects mm-hmm. during the pandemic and how yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. must have been so crazy hard with a house full of people. So I cannot yeah. imagine. It helps me to appreciate. We thought we would be done fast. We started mm-hmm. in 2018. You know, we met mm-hmm. in 2018. We wrote through 2019. And so by the beginning of 2020, we thought, okay, we're almost done. Six more months. We'll probably have it done. And yeah, that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> but it got done. It's done. It's like, actual physical, it is out. physical product. It's true. It's true. <laughs> well, you dedicate the book and you reference this at the end to about the next generation and you mentioned it in your comments earlier. So talk a little bit about your hopes and dreams for the impact of this book on the next generation. Yeah. So maybe this is a little bit addressing your last question too. Mm-hmm. We were pretty conscious that we didn't want to be overly prescriptive in our book because Well, there can be a lot of prescriptives. (laughs) And because Asian America is so diverse, we were trying to say like, hey, here's some stories we have of our own discernment. You know, the introduction focuses on discernment because we felt like, you know, you talk to 10 different Asian Americans following Jesus, you get 10 different stories, right? Yeah, And, yeah. And different people even presented with just what I was saying earlier about the, you were asking about the parents thing and ministry as like, you know, everybody has their own nuances and pieces. There's, of course, there's some um, some generalities or some like tips you can mm-hmm. offer, but it's it's really hard to offer a very prescriptive anything, especially yeah. in communities with so much nuance and so much, you know, does your family come from a Christian background or mm-hmm. not? Or how did they come to faith? Are they immigrants? Are they refugees? You know, socioeconomically, Asian Americans are the most wide range. So it's just, there's a lot. And so Part of what we were trying to do was say, here's our stories of discernment and our friends' stories of discernment, and here's some things we can see that we can offer. And we also hope that you will take this and want to empower folks to write their own stories. Mm. You know, so that's why the, I don't know, what do you call it? Dedication. Dedication. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was like, what's that word? Yeah. Well, that's why the dedication is, is like, you know, to future generations, mm-hmm. right? We hope you'll rewrite this again. When, we did our best. I think yes. is what we said. And yes. we hope you'll rewrite this again when it's time <laughs> to say like, we're not trying to be the end all be all. Mm. We're trying to start conversations. Yeah. So just a, a hope that folks would take what there is and keep running with it. Mm. Yes. Amen to that. We need more resources like this. And it's not divisive that they are out there. <laughs> it's not pulling the church apart uh, to have these conversations. So yeah, that's I yeah. echo that that prayer for and that hope for your book for sure. Well, maybe we'll end here going back to that question about your role as a national leader, because we didn't really get a chance to hear a little bit about what that's been like to be a national leader in an organization as an Asian American woman and want to hear a little bit about that journey. Are there people who have been role models for you? Mm. Are there particularly, I mean, I know that InterVarsity Christian Fellowship as a whole is an organization that has tried, obviously, to work very hard at bringing representation at all levels. That said, still as an Asian American woman in a Christian organization, that's a unique thing to be a national Mm -hmm. leader. So I just would love to hear a little bit about that journey and anything you are Mm -hmm. willing to share about that. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I was recently part of a on the program team for this training for BIPOC and women mm-hmm. in university, mm-hmm. you know, a smaller group of leaders. And one of the things I brought to them was, you know, I, I love university. It's been a place of growth and development and leadership. And at the same time, right, we're still a historically white organization mm-hmm. as most organizations and institutions in the United States. Right. Yes. So I was trying to draw out like, yes. we're part of the U S church. And we're also part of the United States, Mm -hmm. which was just not designed for people like you and me, right? (laughs) It was basically designed for white land-owning men, right? And so so I was like, the farther we are from that, 
just these systems weren't made for us. And people are working to make the systems better. I really mm-hmm. am grateful for that work. But just trying to draw out like, if it's hard, it's because it is hard. Yeah. You know, like it's not you, it's the system. Not to say like we don't have our own individual work to do. We do, but you know, internally, but yeah. just to sort of say that to them. And, and that's been a helpful category in my mind all this time, you know, because it is, you're right. It is less known. It's a less traveled path, mm. I guess we could say. In the first version of the gender chapter that Linson and I wrote together, we actually wrote it, we wrote it more for leaders mm-hmm. and actually like feedback. And, and Al was like, ah, I think this is too, it's a step beyond what this mm-hmm. book is geared towards. And he was right. I mean, we kind of wrote it for ourselves. <laughs> but in that first draft, Linson had this great, amazing story about like being an engineer and because he was also an engineer and working in the industry and mm-hmm. trying to avoid Indian men mm. who were engineers at his company because they were first generation. Mm. And it was that internalized racism. Yeah, I don't yeah, want to yeah. be identified with them. I'm second gen. Yeah. And so he, he wrote about that. And then he wrote sort of very beautifully later about how later on, you know, many years later in ministry, being able to be supervised by an Indian American man in ministry and how he had made this journey for himself. And, da, da, da. and I remember reading that and being like, you know, because we would email each other what we've been working on. I read it and I I had to step away from the computer because I, I had a reaction. I was like, well, what, am I, what is my reaction? I was like, mm. oh, I'm angry. Mm. I was like, why am I angry? I'm like, I've never had a female supervisor <sighs> yeah. in ministry, much less an Asian American, much less a Chinese American, right? Yeah, and I was yeah, like, yeah. there was one woman who supervised me for six months when my supervisor was on sabbatical. And so I was like, but in 20 years, like I haven't, I was like, oh, I have had to... Wow. I don't have that story, right? Yeah. I don't have a story like that. And I was mm. angry. And there's still obviously, and that's okay, right? Anger is part of the process, part mm-hmm. of the journey, right? Mm-hmm. Probably could have talked about that in, mm. in the things we've had to work through. Like, yes. what do I do with my anger? Yes. Because I have a lot and that's okay. That's a good thing. Anger tells us what's not right mm-hmm. with the world. But I realized one thing that that has allowed me to do though, or, or forced me to do is to develop a community, right? Yeah. So. So sisters or friends, community that can cheer me on, mm. right? As we try and figure out like, how does this work, mm-hmm. right? So, mm-hmm. you know, a group of, there's a group of us who gather once a year to like connect and mm-hmm. like trade stories and like cheer each other on via group text as well. And, you know, and then I've had to seek out mentors. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a way that not having had women supervisors or all these different things has pushed me to seek other places. I've had Mm. to find those things in other places. And those things are gifts. I actually think that makes me a better leader. Mm. It makes me appreciate your leadership all the more, makes me appreciate the role you play within university. And of course, the role you played in this book. So thank you, Sabrina. That was just really a fascinating conversation, insightful so many things. I really, I really enjoyed speaking with you today. And I should give you a minute to just share about anything you want to share about any special projects, anything you want to let people (laughs) know about that might be going on in your corner. I think maybe the one thing I would add here at the end is like realizing like, it was in the process of writing, like realizing like, oh, being an author is really hard. You put that (laughs) out there, right? And kind of captures it in one time and space. But it gave us, I think, a lot greater appreciation for those who've gone before us. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think it made me really appreciate, you know, the authors of Following Jesus Without Signing Your Parents Mm -hmm. and More Than Serving Tea. And so as much as we're trying to empower younger generations, it it made me grateful for those who've who've walked some of this path before at a different time. So really grateful. For sure. And now your team, Learning Our Names team, is part of that legacy and uh, will continue (laughs) to help steward Asian American students in this year and the age to come. So yeah, really grateful for all your work. And now we want to let all of you know that you can find Learning Our Names at ivypress.com, along with other IVP resources mentioned in this episode. And if you use the code EVN40, you can get 40% off these books plus free U.S. shipping. That's code EVN40 at ivypress.com. So check out our site to get a great deal on these titles. Thanks everyone for listening to the Every Voice Now podcast brought to you by IVP. 
Our producers and hosts are Paloma Lee and Helen Lee. If you're enjoying our show, we would welcome your reviews and recommendations. You can also support our efforts financially at everyvoicenow.com. And we'd love to hear from you directly anytime. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Every Voice Now, or visit the site for show notes, transcripts, and more. And join us next time for another inspiring episode. Oh,